Hello and welcome back to Postcard, the podcast that takes you on a holiday of the imagination. I'm Greg Dickinson, I'm a journalist at The Telegraph, and so far the photos that our guests on this show have been sharing with us have been kind of amateur travel snaps with amazing stories attached. But today we're doing something a little bit different, because we're going to be talking about three photographs taken by one of the world's finest living photographers, Steve McCurry. As ever, you can view all of the shots online by following the link in the show notes. And I'm really excited to have Steve on the show today because his portfolio spans five decades and way more countries than it will be possible to list here. He's documented war zones, sprawling cities and empty landscapes, and he's received multiple awards for his work in the process. One standout for me, and in fact for everyone, is a photo he took in a refugee camp in 1984. It's of this green-eyed Afghan girl with a tattered red headscarf on her head, and she's looking intensely at the camera. It was actually named the most recognised photograph in the history of National Geographic magazine. And behind the images themselves are some amazing stories of perseverance, a bit of luck, but all fueled by this irrepressible spirit of adventure held by the man behind the camera. I spoke to Steve at his home in Arizona where he's been holed up with his wife and young daughter since lockdown began. And I began by asking him how he came to become a photographer in the first place. Well, my my ambition early on in school was to be a filmmaker. I wanted to make documentary films. And during that course of that, I spent about four years studying filmmaking in university. But I took a couple still photography classes inside that program And that's when I really kind of fell in love with photography, where you could just take your camera out on the street, walk around, and just photograph unscripted, just, you know, photograph the the serendipitous moments. It's much more freewheeling. It was more of an individual endeavor. So I eventually, when I got out of school, it just so happened that the first opportunity that came along was a job at a newspaper. Uh, it wasn't a great job. I was very kind of tedious, uh, repetitive, but I, I stuck it out for a couple of years, saved my money, and with that bit of savings, got a one-way ticket to India because my, my, I, I, w- I wanted to do stories around the world. I wanted to travel. I wanted to go to places like India and Africa and China and Russia and uh, South America. Uh, so I went to India and spent, which was going to be only a six-week trip, it turned into two years. I, I literally stayed there for two years without coming home. And what was that like for you? Like, what do you think it was that kept you there? I just uh, was dashing from incredible stories. I, I mean, I, I rode the, I took so many train journeys throughout India. And I decided, you know, this would be an incredible story to photograph uh, a train journey across the Indian subcontinent. So I went from, uh, you know, Pakistan through India to Bangladesh. And while I was there, this I was there during the monsoon, I also thought, well, uh, you know, th- th- this is also a, a powerful story uh, full of emotion. And uh, I spent, I don't know, six months or whatever in in the monsoon world. And um, it was just an obsession. I just, that's all I wanted to do in in the beginning of my career is just travel and photograph and, and, and see the world. Well, I'm picking up on that. The first photo I want to talk to you about is taken in India. Now, in this shot, we're in the rear passenger seat of a car. We're looking out of a window kind of covered in condensation. And on the other side of the window, there's a young woman wearing a red sari carrying a young child, and they're both looking directly at the camera. Can you tell me, how did this shot actually come about? Oh, sure. So I'm in the back seat of my taxi at a, at a traffic light in, in Mumbai. This mother and child came up to my car window looking for some money, looking for something, and instinctively I just raised my camera, photographed them, this whole took place in five seconds. They were there. I lifted my camera, made two exposures, uh, light changed, and we were in heavy traffic, and we just took off. And I barely remembered 
that moment, uh, I didn't see the film for, I don't know, two months. The window was foggy because of the condensation on the window from the air conditioning. And it's this this child's eyes uh, looking through this foggy window. And uh, this woman had this kind of red dress on. Uh, it, it was a really powerful picture, I thought. Um, but looking at it later when I got back, uh, I thought, you know, this is really kind of this two worlds intersecting. Uh, this woman who's probably trying to make her way in the world with this child, trying to make some money. Uh, she's in the traffic. It's the heat. It's the monsoon. It's heavy rain. It's probably a bit, a bit dangerous out there in the in the traffic. And here I am in this sort of air-conditioned bubble, protected, comfortable, you know, heading back to my hotel. And it was this collision of two worlds. Do you think photography is an important tool to shed light on injustices? I think photography is an incredibly important tool to expose injustice, to, to photograph uh, people who can't tell their story. You're there, you can photograph uh, their life, their situation, and show it to the world. Um, I, I think if you look back at so many great photographs that have been, I think, have changed public opinion. I think of the picture of Nick Ood in Vietnam, the, the, the small girl covered in napalm, uh, fleeing. I mean, that, that that was an incredibly powerful picture at the time. And I think it helped to sway public opinion against the war in Vietnam. There, there's so many pictures. Um, I, I, I can think of pictures by you know Don McCullen or, uh, again, Henri Cartier-Bresson, which show the you know unvarnished truth of life on this planet. So I, I think photography is a powerful, very powerful tool. And obviously now we live in a world where almost everyone has this tool in their pocket, right? Like I'm actually I'm interested to know what your view is on the smartphone phenomenon. Like are you a would you call yourself a real camera purist or do you use a phone to take photos on as well? Well I think uh the quality of cell phones now is extremely high. Uh, I use my, I take photographs uh, on my cell phone like literally every day and videos every day. I think it's a great tool, and uh, it's it's just another way of working. And um, I've actually published pictures uh, with the phone in books and exhibitions. So no, I, I think it's perfectly. Uh, it's a great tool. I guess in some ways the smartphone has sort of like dem democratized photography because previously it was almost out of reach for people to get their hands on these really really good cameras but now i mean obviously smartphones still aren't cheap but you know millions and millions of people around the world have them so i suppose on the one hand that, that means you get you know people who are good natural photographers taking shots on them but i suppose also you have a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of amateur photographers uh, who might not know quite what they're doing well, I think for me, that's okay. I, I think that it's great for people to be able to photograph their friends, their family, uh, events, birthdays, weddings. I think being able to, you know, document our lives and have these memories. I mean, we always talk about how the most important possessions we have are family photos. One, one thing which I think we, it was really important and we're not doing is printing these pictures. I mean, people are taking thousands of pictures on their on their phone, but they're not printing them. And heaven forbid, the phone gets lost. You need to print your favorite important pictures. That's just something which um, I'm always telling people, other photographers or students. You know, take the best pictures, print them, and put them in a drawer or put them in an album uh, for you know for the future. So the next shot I wanted to talk to you about was this um, quite striking image of a elephant with a person sat in a tree. Um, could you describe what's what's happening in this scene? In Thailand, there's an elephant sanctuary where I guess orphan elephants come, uh, and there's each elephant is uh, assigned one attendant called a mahout who feeds it, washes it takes care of it. And uh, this picture is one of these attendants 
with his elephant, and the attendant was um, in a, a kind of relaxing in this sort of uh, a branch of a tree. And it's this, I, I think it's sort of this tender moment where the Mahout is um, resting and the elephants come over and he's sort of waiting or watching or being together. Great thing about photography is you freeze one particular moment. This this could have been a very kind of momentary situation, but you kind of freeze it, uh, ca capture in time. Um, but I love the relationship between the Mahout and the elephant and this sort of fragile human being uh, asleep in the tree or resting in the tree and this enormous giant elephant um, being so uh, kind of tender. I mean, of course, this is all projection on my part. I don't know what was going through the mind of the elephant or the man. But again, that's the great thing about photography. You can see a picture and make up your own story. Uh, imagine a fantasy about what is going on. I mean, that's uh, the ambiguity sometimes is what is the fascination and the beauty because you can sort of give a picture meaning where sometimes there, there is no meaning. So how does photographing animals actually compare to photographing humans for you? Animals, you just have to take what they give you. I mean, they, they're in motion, you know, sometimes they're sleeping, but I, I love animals. And anytime I see an animal uh, that's photographable, I, I definitely will uh, take the opportunity to photograph it. And um, in places like I've been, spent a lot of time in Afghanistan or um you know, India, whatever, there's a lot of domesticated animals and animals are much more visible, much more part of the culture, I would say, than life here in Arizona. One thing I found whenever I've gone out and tried to take my own not so great amateurish wildlife photography is I end up taking hundreds of pictures, like thousands, uh, in search of this perfect moment. Is that something that you find? Like, are animals more film intensive than humans are? Well... I don't, I don't think I'm photographing any more than I, I, I made when I was photo, do, working with film. I think I'm shooting about the same amount of frames. But um, I, I think you tend to shoot more, I suppose, now. Uh, you, you never really know when the peak action is going to occur, whether it's an animal or, or a situation you're photographing with people. So you have to keep working. So, yeah, I, tend, I think you tend to have – you photograph a lot because – you know, was that the best moment or should I wait some more? You wait, there's something better, you photograph that. I think you have to keep working the situation until you, until the whale has disappeared or the confrontation you've been photographing uh, dissipates um, or the person you're photographing on the street decides that they've, they have to leave and the, 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 this sort of portrait session is over. Uh, I found a lot of times people, when you meet them on the street, they're very enthusiastic initially to be photographed. They're very willing to be photographed. But, you know, maybe after a minute or two or three, uh, they get impatient and then they decide, well, you know, I have to, you know, I, I got to go. I'm, I'm late for an appointment or whatever. So you have that initial period of goodwill. And then eventually uh, that that kind of curve kind of starts to diminish and then they start to kind of end antsy and want to leave so you have to really kind of work fast but you have to keep shooting because people's expressions always change and if you only have a minute or two or three and, and you want to get an expression that is genuine that's that doesn't look self-conscious or um uh, so you, you got to keep shooting and wait to get that right right moment well talking of capturing the right moment the third photo you've chosen is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful ones of yours that I've seen. So here we're sitting in the back of a narrow boat, a little bit like a punt, and we're floating on this wide green river. Um, it's kind of cloaked with water lilies. There are trees lining the river either side, and the water's stretching out into the vanishing point of the shot. At the front of the boat, there's this man paddling with his back to us, but between us and him, the boat is filled with these beautiful bunches of fresh-cut red, purple, and yellow flowers. Can you tell me a bit about how you captured this shot and what was the story behind it? I spent about three months or four months photographing in Kashmir. Uh, I was staying in a hotel right next to Dal Lake. 
And every day I would go out, I would see these flower sellers going around selling uh, their flowers in these really colorful boats. And I thought, you know, there's definitely a picture in that situation. And uh, eventually I went out, I went out to the market and I met some of these flower vendors and I photographed them from my, my boat. I hired a boat. And eventually I thought, you know what, I, I, what would it be like if I actually got in one of their boats and went around with them through the lake as they sold their their flowers? So on, I think, three or four different occasions during this course of this th- these months I was in Kashmir, I would sit in the back of their, their shikar, their, their kind of canoe, and... Um, would go around with them for an hour or two, especially very early in the morning, just after sunrise. And I would photograph them in different light, different situations. And one one morning, this one vendor went through this kind of lagoon, and the background was very nondescript. It was there was nice light, and as he was paddling the canoe, his hand would go into the highlight of the picture, kind of accenting it. And for a, a few frames, for a few moments, I saw this, the, the shape of this man, his, his arm going th- paddling. And I, I knew that that was gonna be a, a moment. And I, I've, I probably f- made hundreds and hundreds of pictures, not only of, uh, of this particular vendor, but also other vendors and other situations, other days. And when I got back to edit, to, to select through the selection, of the film, I, I found, uh, I don't know, maybe out of those hundreds of pictures, I found like five uh, that I really thought were worth, worth keeping and printing. So for this shot in particular, I'm, I'm, imagining, yeah, I'm imagining you perched on the back of the boat. Have you ever been in any precarious positions or felt like you were at all at risk in, in the pursuit of taking the perfect photograph? Well, right in the beginning of my kind of freelance career. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, uh, in Cambodia during the time of the Khmer Rouge, and in, in Lebanon during that civil war back in the uh, early, late 70s, early 80s. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when you find yourself under fire or, uh, you know, the front line and the bullets are whizzing by and bombs are dropping, uh, you ask yourself, you know, kind of what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> uh, I, I was never a war photographer. I, I was always interested in the, the the consequence of war on civilians and refugees. And uh, it, particularly in Afghanistan, when a village was under attack or had been destroyed, uh, what happened to those people? Uh, where did they go? What did they do? That That to me was more important than photographing the combatants or the bang bang part of the story I was I, I can't imagine what it would be like to sort of have a happy happy life in a village uh, in, in Afghanistan with your you know family and your fields and your and then suddenly one day you know a helicopter gunship comes by and destroys your village and you have to flee within hours with a few family possessions. And and sleep outside for the first couple of days, and then find try to get to a refugee camp. I mean, it's just um, it's a nightmare. And I think that trying to help those people tell their story was what I thought was um, something I could do to make a kind of a contribution or a difference. So obviously, most of the conflict zone shots you've taken have been overseas in places like Afghanistan or Iraq. But then on September the eleventh, two thousand and one a conflict zone suddenly materialised in downtown Manhattan. And you happened to have just arrived in the city with your camera. Is that right? Yeah, I, I had literally just gotten off the plane the night before from China. I went home. I, I was jet lagged. I went to sleep. I put my equipment and luggage off in the corner. And uh, when I got up in the morning, I went to my office. I just It's just a, about a 15-minute walk from the World Trade Center. And... Um, uh, I was opening up my mail, and we got the news that the World Trade Center was on fire. So I, I grabbed my camera up on the roof, and within a few minutes, the first tower kind of imploded, and was suddenly like, I thought, 
this is impossible, this is a dream. And then after a few more minutes, the second tower went down, and I suddenly realized that my, you know, the world had changed, and that this catastrophic event had taken place, and it was real. So I, I grabbed my equipment and, and just ran down to photograph. Uh, I, I wasn't thinking about anything other than somebody. This has to be documented. This is an historic moment, and this needs to be recorded. This needs to be remembered. So I went down there and spent the entire day. I, I was there till 8.30 at night, kind of in shock. I was more on automatic pilot, just photographing, because that's what I have, had always done, and I just wanted to have some kind of record of what had happened that day. And what um what did you find when when you got there? Like what what was the scene like? How did you feel being there? Well, I remember there was complete devastation for blocks, and I remember this fine white dust that had covered the entire area, and there were you know firemen, police who were frantic and really upset. They didn't want any photographers there. Didn't want anybody there. They were very aggressive. Uh, but the, the devastation, the, the twisted metal, and was just, again, just went on for what seemingly forever, for blocks and blocks. But there was no, nothing in the rubble that looked like any desks or computers or anything. It was just, everything had been pulverized, and it was just, just wrecked. So I, as I got closer to Ground Zero, I could start to see destroyed, you know, ambulances and fire trucks, and uh, and then there were, you know, then suddenly within a few hours there were hundreds of uh, people digging through the rubble, and I was trying to f photograph them from different windows because it became very difficult to be there. Uh, we kept getting told to leave, but I, I just, ha I, 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 you know, I knew I had to stay and and document this. Wow. One, one of the final questions I wanted to ask you, Steve, is, is obviously you've traveled extensively around the world, but is there a place or, or a specific person that you've always dreamt of photographing? Well, I've always wanted to go to Iran. I've photographed most of the countries in that region all around Iran. Uh, I have a lot of Iranian friends. Um, I'm very familiar with the culture. And I've tried repeatedly to get a visa. But because of the bad blood between the U.S. and Iran, it's very, very difficult. I actually have an exhibit in Iran at the moment, but have not been able to go there either as a photographer or as just a, a tourist or in any capacity um, I'm hoping that that changes at some point. Maybe uh, as I get older and older, maybe they'll just take pity on this <laughs> this old guy because I won't po pose any harm. Who knows? <laughs> do you actually have any? Um, do you have any set in stone plans for? Obviously, everything's kind of you know stuck in time a bit at the moment as the the world is still largely in lockdown. But wh where will you be going once it's over? Do you have any plans immediately after after international travel resumes? I had had a full travel schedule starting in April, May, June. Uh, it was going to be, I was going to be traveling th through Asia, uh, Malaysia, the Philippines, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, in China. I was planning to go to Scotland. I had a lot of travel scheduled and everything has been uh, postponed. Um, I'll definitely get back on the road, but sitting here today uh everything's kind of up in the air and i guess it'll be it's going to be fascinating when you do get back on the road because one thing that's really struck me about the whole coronavirus crisis is just how striking the photography's been like the world has changed and we're relying entirely on footage and photographs to get a picture of what's going on and i think i've seen some of the most peculiar scenes <laughs> in the last two months and that surely it's it's going to be a really interesting time for a photographer like yourself to capture people and cultures and civilizations yeah i would love to have uh 
been in New York City and photographed what life is like now, the empty streets, the masks, uh, the the health workers. Uh, but I just looked at the situation. I thought, you know, I got a, I have a family now. Um, I'm in the wrong age category. And uh, if this, if I was 20 or 30 years younger, you know, I would have been all over this thing. But uh, it, it's a little bit odd to be on the sidelines and to see this historic situation unfold and not document it. But um, I, I want to be able to live another day and tell other stories. So I decided to kind of sit this one out. And uh, there's some amazing work being done by uh, some very courageous photographers. And, um, you know, it's just, um, I mean, hopefully a once in a lifetime situation. Hopefully the in the future we'll be able to deal better than we're doing now. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a historic moment we're living in. Steve, thank you so much for sharing your photographs with us and for telling us the stories behind them. I've, I've enjoyed it hugely. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. That was Steve McCurry. Next week, we have Adia Depitan, Paralympic basketball player turned TV travel presenter, who told me about the time that he leapt out of his wheelchair to climb up a volcano in Nicaragua, an encounter with a one-eyed boxer in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and this on how he nearly got kidnapped in Mexico City. Some people in the hotel were obviously bribed by some local gangsters who'd seen me and probably thought because I was in a wheelchair I was vulnerable. It was a pretty crazy situation. Postcards is presented by me, Greg Dickinson, in my homemade studio comprising pillows, a duvet and a housemate who I've asked to keep quiet for an hour or two. It's produced by Pete Norton and Theodora Leludis. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Or tell a friend about the podcast. It takes just a few seconds, but it will really help us to spread the word. And remember that you can see all of the photos mentioned in the show online via the link in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next week for Addy's Chat.